Father, I pray once again that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The church calendar is divided up into six seasons. It begins with Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, then Lent, then Easter, and then you have uh, the Pentecost season. The season of Easter, we often think of Easter as one day, but it's actually 50 days, the season. And the 40th day of the season of Easter is Ascension Day. And it commemorates that 40th day after his resurrection in which Jesus appears to his disciples and then ascends as we read about in this story from Acts chapter 1 this morning. And the ascension, I find, is probably uh, one of the, 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 the moments of Jesus' life that is probably not talked about near as much as some of the others. We often hear about uh, the incarnation, and we hear about the, the crucifixion and the resurrection, and we, we talk a lot about the second appearing, but in the middle of that is the ascension. And I think that, that it, it's not talked about near as much as it probably should be. There are places of the world where the ascension is, is celebrated in, in big ways. There are some countries where there are great processions and celebrations. I read about one country where someone dresses up uh, like the devil, and they chase the devil through the streets of the city. They, they burn the devil in effigy, and you know, they have this great celebration. It sounds almost like uh, an ascension Mardi Gras type of atmosphere. I, I, at the same time, you know, where people, are, as they're trying to, to enhance this day and to bring it, make it uh, more visible for us, I read about one pastor who uh, decided to hook himself up to a wire and had pulleys and things, and so as he's preaching on the ascension, he, the guys off stage are lifting him up to the ceiling. I, I thought about that today. I wasn't sure how we were going to get make that happen here in the church, but I can tell you that would be a memorable day, right? It's one of those days where everybody would say, I was in church that Sunday when Pastor West went up to the ceiling. The, it, it, we're trying to, trying to make something that you know, we won't talk about that much memorable. And I think about, as I think about that day, though, the, having celebrations and things aren't what immediately come to my mind. Because when I think about the ascension, I think about Jesus leaving his disciples. Remember that moment when your parents left you for the first time at camp? Or maybe that first day of school? Maybe the first day of college? And I remember back that, that first day of college, and I was excited to start college, but I was also nervous. I, I, we had just moved from, Oregon, from Indiana to Oregon. I didn't know anybody at the school. I had not yet met my roommate. I had no connections with anyone, and I felt very alone and anxious and uncertain. And a little bit of me, as I watched my parents drive away, wanted to run after them and say, I've changed my mind. I get the feeling that that would be what the disciples might be thinking. Jesus is their security blanket. Jesus is the one they continually lean to. I think they've gotten used to over the 40 days of seeing Jesus. This resurrected Christ and, and engaging with him. And I suspect there's something in the back of our mind, their minds that's thinking it's just always going to be this way. And to watch Jesus leave them, had to be a bit gut-wrenching. But what I find so fascinating is that in Luke's gospel, his description of this event is that they are, they not, just, they not, they, they are not just sad, but it says when they, when they are done, when Jesus ascends, they go back to Jerusalem and they praise him with great joy. And I'm asking myself, why do they praise him with great joy? This moment that you would think would be uh, the most devastating moment outside of the crucifixion that they've experienced. And yet there's something that they are getting. They're starting to understand about what this moment means. 
I think it's important that, that they see Jesus ascend to feel that joy. Just as the disciples need to see the risen Christ and not just an empty tomb, I think it's imperative that they actually see Jesus ascend and not just are told about it. Because if they, aren't, if they don't actually see it happen, then they're going to continually think that Jesus is out there somewhere. Why isn't he coming to us? Why isn't he talking to us? Why isn't he appearing to us? What's wrong? And maybe even to think, well, the resurrection was awesome. We had a great 40 days, but maybe that's, all, that's it. And maybe the resurrection really wasn't as eternal as we'd like to think it is. They need to see it happening. And in seeing it happen, there is something about that that brings joy to them. As we move our way, make our way through the scriptures, we get a sense of why they may have felt joy and what the ascension means. Whether they comprehended that fully or not, Paul and other writers of scripture, Jesus himself, help us understand. For one thing, scripture tells us that because Jesus ascends, he's now interceding for us with the Father. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes, who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Hebrews 7, as we read a few moments ago in the call to worship, therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. This is what Christ is doing. Ken Ching points out in his book, the Jesus, the Mission, that that. Jesus' intercession is probably not exactly like the Holy Spirit's intercession of prayer, but Jesus is more of a lawyer, more of an advocate of reminding, of of bringing before the Father the cross and His blood that sets us free from the guilt of our sin. Jesus is continually interceding for us. You know, when I, sometimes when I, sometimes people that I went to high school with or college will pop into my head. You ever have that happen to you? You know, where people you hadn't thought about for years, all of a sudden they come to your mind for some reason. And you think to yourself, I wonder what they're doing. I wonder what their lives are like. I wonder, I wonder what's happening with them. You haven't been in contact for 30 or 40 years. What's funny is that when I think about that, I never think to myself, I'll bet people are thinking the same thing about me. I'm, I'm, I, never, and I never expect anyone that I, in the same way to think the same things about me. I just don't think people would think about that. I think there's something in us that finds it a bit difficult to believe that God is continually thinking about us. But Jesus is continually thinking about us. It's an awesome thing to ponder. But the scriptures also tell us that it's only because Jesus ascends that he is then able to reappear. It's because he ascends to the Father that we know the promise that Jesus is going to reappear someday, usher in the kingdom in all of its fullness, put everything to right, and give us resurrected bodies to live with him in eternity. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul talks about this in John uh, 14, because I go to prepare a place for you. This is, this is what he is calling us, what he has promised us, that he is going to return. And because he ascends, he is now able to return. But there is another dynamic of the ascension that we also find in Scripture that I'm not sure, that, at least for me, that I really grasped until relatively recently is that it's not so much that Jesus has, it's not only that Jesus is interceding for us, it's not that, that Jesus is going to reappear for us. Those things that are happening outside of our consciousness. But the reality of the ascension is that Jesus is King. He is Lord. And the ascension is his means of taking his throne now and forever. And he is not just the king someday. He's the king now. He is reigning now. Paul writes in in 1 Corinthians 
15, Christ reigns until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. He is reigning now until that day when he humbles all of them, and then he will continue to reign, but he is reigning now. And we think about Satan, and so he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Satan who is the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. And we think, well, that looks to us like the, the, the evil one is reigning. But his power is limited because of Christ. And so Paul writes in Colossians, For Christ has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. I love the fact that Paul isn't talking about just the future. He's talking about the present. That Christ is enthroned now. And when he ascends into heaven, he takes his seat. And he reigns as king eternal. He is Lord of all. One writer points out that that when Jesus, at his baptism, Jesus is is crowned, is baptized king, but he's sort of king in waiting. But at the ascension, his kingdom is is realized and launched in all of its fullness. He is king. N.T. Wright talks about how there are people who swore that they saw Julius Caesar rise out of his body and his soul rise to heaven. And Wright wonders if one of the things that Luke is doing in, in his description of Jesus' ascension is to send a message that it's not that that whatever happened with Caesar, Jesus is greater. And his message is one in which Caesar is not Lord, Jesus is. And so John Stott says, you know, we talk about these great kings of history. We talk about um, Herod the Great, and we talk about Charles the Great and Napoleon the Great. He said, we don't talk about Jesus the Great Because Jesus is not just one of the great. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the only one. He's the king who is reigning now. And he isn't reigning, he hasn't hasn't removed himself from the earth. He is reigning on the earth through the Holy Spirit. And that's the other part of the ascension. Jesus talks often about the fact that when he, when he goes away from them, he will send the Holy Spirit. And we need the Holy Spirit. He promises in various places that the Holy Spirit will come and the Holy Spirit will make his people holy. He will make us like Christ. He will not only forgive our sins, but he will give us power to be free from our sins. I love the image that Emily gave us in the children's sermon. I do want to make a disclaimer that you, know, you may not want to try that at home, children, without parental supervision of pouring all that water into that glass. But the Holy Spirit comes, and we are made holy. There is a power in us through the Holy Spirit, a victorious power. And why is it that we're made holy? We are not just made holy so we can talk about how wonderful we are. We're made holy so that ultimately we can be witnesses of Jesus Christ. It's been God's plan from the beginning that he would call out people, he would set them apart, he would make them holy as his people so that they would be his witnesses to people who do not know him. And so in Acts chapter 1, the disciples' concern is when. Jesus, when are you going to appear? When are you going to restore the kingdom? And Jesus' answer is, nobody knows when except the Father. But here's what I want you to know. Don't worry about when, worry about this. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the Holy Spirit is going to come and make you holy to be my witnesses. The church 
is the presence of Christ in this world. As crazy as that sounds, the church is the presence of Christ here. We come as his agents of grace and hope and truth and mercy and love. You know, when when Secretary of State Blinken goes to Beijing and meets with President Xi, or when he goes to Nigeria and meets with President Mubari, Buhari, he, he's representing President Biden. Nobody there is thinking he's President Biden. No one, and, but, and no one thinks that, that he is on his own. Everyone knows that he is there as a representative of the president. But here's what's interesting. What he says and does is a direct reflection of President Biden. And he speaks for President Biden in that moment. And his actions represent President Biden in that moment. And I think there is something similar of what we are called to be. We are called to be representatives of the king. We represent him. And we can say, well, I don't really want to. That's not really, we have no choice of that. The moment we make a claim to follow Jesus, we are representing him. And the question is not, will we be representatives or not? The question is, what kind of representatives will we be? Will we be representatives who, who exhibit the behavior and the attitudes and the words and the actions of Christ or something else? And someone and I were talking about this recently, and they said, you know, when you think about it, it seems kind of unwise that God would take out of the game his best player and leave everybody else. Thought, you know, that's, a, that's a really quite, it's, it's true. I mean, you stop and think about it. I mean, here is Jesus who is the perfect representation of Christ. He is God in flesh. Here is Jesus who people look at him and say, that's exactly what God is and, and no difference. And God pulls him out of the game and says, now I'm going to let you folks play instead. Doesn't seem wise in the long run, does it? Philip Yancey talks about the fact that when Jesus ascends to heaven, he is taking a huge risk that people will forget him. Because they get distracted by those who say they follow him. And yet... God believes this is a great plan because it's been his plan from the beginning. And we have not just the responsibility, we have the privilege, the privilege of being agents of Christ in this world. We would not have that privilege if Christ didn't ascend. There's no way we would have the same privilege if Christ did not ascend. And he ascends to give us the joy and the privilege and, yes, the responsibility of being his witnesses, his presence in this world. We cannot do it by ourselves, only in the power of the Holy Spirit. Only in the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the great struggles we have as representing God is that something in us believes that we can represent God without the Holy Spirit in us. We can represent God without worrying too much about how much time we spend in the Scriptures or how much time we spend in prayer or in public worship or private worship or how much time we spend in in acts of of piety and generosity and, and all of the means of grace that enable us to open our hearts more and more to the filling of the Spirit. Something in us says that we can be adequate witnesses of Christ without that, and it's impossible. Those things are not, they're not rules, they're not regulations. They are means of grace by which our hearts become more and more open to the Spirit of Christ to fill us and to transform us and to change us so that we can be witnesses. Will Willimon says that one day he was talking with a former parishioner uh, whose wife of 56 years had just died. And he was trying to speak some words of comfort to him, and the man said to him, he said, preacher, he said, I've been, I've been preparing for this moment for a month of Sundays. He said, all of the sermons I've heard 
all the Sunday school classes I've sat through, all the scripture I've read, all the prayers I've prayed, all the ways in which I have I've developed my walk with Christ are preparing me for this moment. He said, the question is, how well did I listen? All of these things are meant to prepare us. They're not an end in and of themselves. They are means of grace to make us like Christ, that the Spirit can work in us, and we can be agents of the risen, reigning King. You know, when I think about, um, when I think about the, the ascension and this, this waiting period between the time when Christ has ascended and when he will reappear, this waiting that is so difficult and so hard, my mind often reflects back to one of the last scenes in the movie Apollo 13. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, Apollo 13. It's one of my favorite movies. So if you haven't seen it, I would recommend it. I think I can recommend it pretty safely. But it's the story of the Apollo 13 crew. They, they, their plan is to the launch to, to go to the moon and, and to land on the moon. And as they are making their way, an explosion takes place and, and they have to return to earth. There's all kinds of drama and, and trauma that takes place to get them turned around, to get them in the right place, heading back to earth. And then they, they are coming to the most dangerous moment when they have to re-enter earth's atmosphere. And they have to, they have to get it just right because if, they're, if the angle is wrong, they'll bounce off and be lost forever. If the angle's wrong another way, they'll burn up in the atmosphere. There's this critical moment where they have to enter the atmosphere at just the right angle, at just the right speed, just the right way. And there's a moment in time where they were at the command center in Houston, they know they're going to lose their picture and the radio silence for about three minutes. It's going to take about three minutes. And during that time, they will not be able to communicate with the space capsule. And as the scene unfolds in the movie, there is this silence as they watch this blank screen all throughout Mission Control. Everyone's standing there doing nothing. There's nothing they can do just to watch. And the scene moves to, uh, to some of the astronaut, astronauts' wives and their families and friends as they stare at a blank screen on a television waiting. And it keeps going back and forth and different people. And all they can do is stand and wait. And the clock is ticking down from three minutes to zero. And they get it. Actually, I guess it's going from zero to three minutes. And when it gets to three minutes, they see and hear nothing. It goes to three and a half minutes. You can see the, the, the fear and the anxiety rising. And it gets to four minutes and everyone is wondering what's happened. And they keep waiting and waiting and waiting as this ominous music plays in the background. And then they hear this little bit of a crackle like noise. And they hear, Houston, we made it. And the picture comes back on the screen and everyone cheers. It's a glorious moment. But what I think about is as we wait, we're not like those people waiting for that spaceship because they don't know if it's going to happen. We know Jesus is the reigning, returning king. And all they can do is stand there and wring their hands and wait filled with anxiety and fear. We don't live that way. We live in joy, and we live in mercy, and we live in grace, and we live in truth, and we live in confidence. And when you know that Jesus is the King, you can live differently than if you're unsure. 
We don't live in this world wringing our hands, wondering what's going to happen in fear and anxiety. We live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can live in the authority of Christ. I love the, the end of, of, the, of the Sermon on the Mount when, when Matthew says that when Jesus finished speaking, the people were in awe at his authority because he didn't teach like the other people. And when you go back and look at what is it about the authority of Jesus that he's teaching, what does he say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those when they persecute you. The road is narrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's a different kind of mindset that we live with. So my question for us today is, are we living as if we believe that Jesus is the king? Or are we not? Are we living in a, in a way that, that we're having to, to fight and prove that we're right and, and in a way that, that looks just like everybody else? Are we living in the power of the Holy Spirit? power of holiness, that power of truth, the power of love and grace and mercy of Christ. Holy Father, we come today to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and King. And we ask that you would so fill us with your Spirit that we live in the holy confidence of that truth. To be your people who look like Jesus and act like Jesus and think like Jesus through your wondrous grace. Amen.